Good. Good to go. Right. Um, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels um, wrote the Communist Manifesto uh, in the winter of December of uh, 1847 and January of 1848 at the behest of the, uh, see I don't recall exactly what it was called, but it was a Communist Party in Europe. Um, and uh, they were in their 20s when they wrote it, and this was right before the revolutions of 1848. Um, and that's just to give a little bit of a historical background of the, the uh, two authors. Um, but to begin, uh, they, Karl Marx and Engels, they describe that uh, there's a specter haunting Europe, and it's the specter of communism, which is this boogeyman that everybody's afraid of. Um, and their, their aims in the manifesto is to dispel any misconceptions and make it clear the exact points uh, of the Communist Party and of communists. Um, and the first section, it's, the, it's divided into four sections, each uh, describing a different aspect. The first, set, the first uh, section <coughs> um, describes the relation of bourgeois and proletarians. Uh, which in more contemporary terms are the, the capitalists and the working class, or the owners and the working class, owners of the, the factories, uh, the vast majority of property. Um, and they begin by giving a historical outline of the capitalist class. Um, and it, uh, it descended from feudalism which was basically kings and monarchs ruled everything and under them there were lords that owned the land um, and serfs that worked the land. Um, and as, as, the, as feudalism was falling in the French Revolution and just, just throughout, um, the bourgeois uh, basically seized control of production, taking it from the guilds um, that were the previous producers, and they organized it uh, into kind of an assembly, very uh, disassociative kind of assemb assembly style manufacturing system. Um, they then began to, to uh, develop factories, more further develop them, increase technology, uh, began using steam powers powered uh, machinery, but the, the most significant thing about the capitalists is that they simplified all of the class relations, so there were no longer multiple you know, guilds, there were no longer multiple serfs and lords, it, it simplified the class struggles into the two, the two camps, the capitalists and the workers. Um, and they used uh, colonialism and imperialism to drive growth. Well, this was facilitated by the discovery and opening of new markets in the Americas, in the East Indies, and China. Um, and they, the, the capitalist class grows in proportion to advances in the market and advances in, the, in production. Um, and, and, th and by seizing control, they destroyed all of the previous relations of trade for the relationship of profit. It became their sole motive. Um, this becomes modern industry, which is sort of a globalized market um, at its earliest form, and it has since grown and become what it is today. Um, one, the one of the most interesting things about capitalism is that it generates its own destruction through overproduction and exploitation of the, the working class. Um, overproduction, just in, in, in the drive to create more profit, they produce more to meet quotas to prove growth, you know, and uh, eventually create so, many excess, so much excess uh, that they've wasted and squandered all the materials and now there's a products that no one can use and uh, bankrupt themselves essentially. 
Um, but the the other the other great flaw in capitalism is that it generates the proletariat, specifically the revolutionary proletariat, the working class that has been so far exploited that they need to overthrow uh, capitalism. Um, characteristics of the proletariat is that they, they live only as long as they can find work because the only thing they have of value is their labor power. Um, and and with, with the development of machinery and production, they become part of the machines and, and the, the sort of romance of working becomes simplified as you're just as, as the worker becomes an appendage, uh, merely an overseer of a machine, um, mentally disengaged from their work. Um, and and it, capitalism generates, it, it breaks down the barriers between men and women, uh, essentially, where men and women become equally qualified to observe a machine. Um, and and the, the only difference between men and women under capitalism is that there are just different types of commodities, one more expensive than the other, or, uh, you know, and they're, they're evaluated as commodities and not as people. Um, other, other ways the proletariat are exploited, the working class are exploited, is that uh, other aspect, other elements of the capitalist classes like landlords and and like chiefly the biggest example is landlords um, that take the wages that the proletariat that the working class earns uh, as, as part of staying alive um, and capitalism also destroys uh, small business mom and pop establishments uh, because the mom and pop establishments can't compete on the largest scale that you know, the capitalists can. But uh, the proletariat, the working class, they advance their struggle against the capitalist classes. And this is shown in several phases. Um, their, first, their initial reaction is to destroy the machines and destroy competing products, um, which really it is by and large ineffectual um, because they're not confronting the root of the problem. Um, in the second phase, the, the, the working class are so uh, demoralized that they begin to, like they, they, they become, the, the divisions between the working class become invisible and dissolve. Um, so unions can begin to form and they, and that's necessary to maintain the survival of the working class. Um, and the third phase, oh, uh, the thing about unions is that the victory is not the success of the union itself, but the further organization of the working class. So unions are not, unions under the capitalist, unions under capitalism is not the end goal. It's just a measure of the success of the organization of the proletariat. Um, and the third step is they is the proletariat, the working class. They begin to form as a class, uh, and they, they fight for their class interests. Um, and then they they will also begin to form a political party and begin to make political demands. Um, now. On, uh, the, the, the position of the working class in this capitalist structure is that the, the working class are without property. They have no, no way to produce anything. And by, by property, it's meant uh, machines, tools used for production. They have no way to generate profit anywhere near the scale of the, the capitalists. Um, and... Uh, The uh, other, the bourgeois, when they fought against the, the capitalists, when they fought against the feudalists, um, the, their revolution, they essentially sieged the feudalists, the 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 monarchs' means of appropriation, 
of ways of taking production, um, and the capitalists made it their own. But because the working class have no way to appropriate like that, they have to acquire, they have to completely reinvent any sort of means of appropriation. Um, they they can't they can't use the capitalist system to fight the capitalists. They have to abolish the system to fight the capitalists. Um, and the nature of the struggle is that the proletariat, the working class, they're the vast majority, um, and each each country, each nation, uh, need, needs to have its own working class overthrow its own bourgeois. Um, and the, the, the biggest, the biggest uh, I guess, detriment the working class faces is that as capitalism expands, it, it will degrade the worker so that they can't even continue a slavish existence. Um, and when, once, once, that, once, once it reaches that point, revolution is inevitable when the capitalists can't even keep their workers alive then the workers will undoubtedly revolt or the workers will die and capitalism will fail. So those are the two ways that capitalism is due to fail. Um, either by its own overthrow or it will eat itself to death. Um, and then the necessity of, of labor, of, of things like building schools and roads, is should create you know, greater it, it creates connections between the workers. So a worker will have solidarity with his comrade before it will have solidarity with a capitalist. And that will that, that is the greatest destruct that will bring the greatest destruction of the capitalist. Um, is is through solidarity of the workers. Um, the second section of the manifesto is the distinction between the working class and communists, um, sort of the role of communists in today's society. Um, communists don't have any separate interests beyond the worker and the workers' rights and the worker parties. Um, the the main the main uh, task of the communist is um, to bring the concerns of the working class, the international working class, to the forefront of the political scene, um, and they also and they. Communists represent the working class movement as a whole, instead of individual moments in the revolution, in the struggle, I guess. Um, and and the great advantage, if you want to call it that, of communists over the proletariat is not like a, a leverage advantage. It's just we know the line of march, we know we're aware of how the fight is going to be fought. We have the ability to organize the great mass and make it more effective. Um, and one of, the, one of the greatest criticisms that the communists get is that we, we seek to abolish private property. Um, and that, that's only true if you define property as the means of production, as the factories, because, you know, uh, proletariat, we, we don't have property. Uh, wage labor doesn't generate property for the worker, but it generates capital for the capitalist. Um, and this capital is not private property, but it's, it's a social power, it's a social property. And that's, that's why uh, that's, that's, that's why we have to remove capital from the question in, in our society and make it a worker's state of sorts. That's the term we want to use. Um, and the, the role of the, the worker under capitalism is that, again, it creates capital for the capitalist, but under, under communism, the means of production, capital, quote unquote, it, it, it'll serve to help human lives instead of going to some, <laughs> instead of, you know, 10 workers' money going into one capitalist pocket to 11 workers' work will go into the betterment of all that need it. Um, and there, there is, 
there's a, a rumor that communists seek to abolish aspects of society like freedom. And the only the only freedom that needs to be abolished is the freedom to buy and sell. Is the freedom of free trade. It's the only freedom that is that we in a capitalist society have, and that we and it's the only freedom that communists seek to abolish. Um, and so essentially, it's the freedom abolished is the freedom to be part of the capitalist class. Um, aspects of culture that we wish to abolish is, uh, or one of the one of the rumors is that communists seek to abolish culture, and they, they say that once a, a commune or a socialist society is instated, um, individuals will cease to exist. Um, and they'll become lazy. Like you, you, you'll cease to be a, a defined human being, and you'll just become a, a lazy, a part of the lazy mass. And if that were true, um, then we would have degenerated already under capitalism, because the ones that work have nothing. The ones that do all the work have nothing, and the ones that have everything do no work. Um, and and another another part of intellectual culture that will change is that. We, we won't we won't be trained to become a part of the capitalist machine anymore. Uh, educate like schools and the education system will be completely redefined um, to to fit better the needs of actual society instead of capitalist society. Um, there, there's rumors that the communists wish to abolish the family, but the the way the family is set up now is a, a capitalist relation. Um, the, the there's a the communists want to replace the system of exploitation of women, um, which is by the dual names of prostitution and marriage, um, and one of the one of the themes in this is the reserve labor force, re referring to women who under a capitalist society are expected to stay at home and take care of the house and raise the children essentially for free. Um, under, under under the guise of being part of this nuclear family, um, it, it becomes a money relation and a power relation more than a familial love relation or anything of that sort. Um, uh, rumor is that the communists want to abolish the countries and nations, but the working class have no country. They're they're not they're not considered in any aspect of the political strata in this capitalist society. Um, we have no country, we have no reason to be loyal to any current country unless it is for the goal, for, unless it is pro-worker, a communist country. Um, um, <clears throat> and the communists wish to abolish uh, various philosophies, religions, and ideologies, but um, the, the, the only way that ideologies develop is through consciousness of your material conditions. Um, an example of this would be, you know, I mean, to illustrate, when I was a child I had no, no idea of what having a phone would be like, but it's become such a you know, vital part of this society that my consciousness has changed. I've, I've become a phone user as phones have become more prevalent. Um, and th these are the only Ideals that will change, um, and and any any sort of religious or sort of eternal idea they mask they, they only serve to mask class antagonisms, and so those are the sorts of ideas we wish to abolish. Um, in manifesto, Karl Marx gives a, a list of ten points that would apply to some countries. Um, in this 150th anniversary edition, it's on page 42. I don't know if any of you have it. I'm just read along. Um, but I'm going to read them out. Uh, point number one is the abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. Uh, number two is a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Number three is abolition of all right of inheritance. Number four is confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. Emigrants, not immigrants. 
any, any anyone wishing to leave um, or rebel against the system will have rebel against the communist state, the workers' state, the socialist state. Um, will will be, be confiscated. Um, number five is centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. Point number six is centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. So public transportation, forms of communication, telephone lines, internet, etc. Um, number, point number seven is the extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state bringing into cultivation of waste lands and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with the common plan. Uh, point number eight is equal liability of all to labor, establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Point number nine is combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between the town and country, and by a more equitable distribution of the population over the country. Uh, better space management, better resources management. Uh, point number 10 is free education for all children in public schools, uh, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, etc., etc. Uh, like uh, education in the forms of trade education or intellectual education if you plan on going into academia or whatever the case may be, uh, would be integrated with your progression in that field. Um, the nature of let's see, political power is it's used by one class to suppress another, and that's why the proletariat must form themselves into a class to win the battle against the capitalists, uh, wrest political power from the capitalists, and smash them with it. Um, and in section three, uh, I think I, I didn't understand how, how it would connect, but this it gives a brief. Uh, in 1848, it was a brief summary of other communist and socialist parties, and Marx and Engels, they kind of debunk them um, and prove why they're not revolutionary. Um, and the, the first one, the, he splits it up into three sections, and the first is uh, reactionary socialism, um, and it's feudal socialism, which made the criticism of capitalists and their, their criticism was that it uh, created the revolutionary working class. Um, and so feudal socialism, they sought to rewind the wheel of you know, history and reestablish a feudal system in which there would be no bourgeois, proletariat antagonisms. Um, but that's, it, it, it would never, history can never wind itself. And, that's essentially flawed, and the, the only thing that these feudal socialists did was publish you know, pundits and witticisms to criticize the capitalists. Um, and then there's petty bourgeois socialism, which is small businesses essentially, and capitalism has already destroyed essentially the petit bourgeois, um, the small business owners, the mom and pop establishments. And then the, the third under reactionary is uh, German or true socialism, and essentially German philosophers got a hold of French socialist material, like writing, writings and uh, essays and such, and uh, they 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 read it they read the French literature through a a German perspective, and at the time uh, Germany had not been relieved of its and feudal nature it had not been, you know, the, it, it was not yet a truly capitalist society. And so it uh, was kind of out of focus and obscure. But then the, second section, the second section of uh, the, these uh, historically ineffective socialist and communist parties was conservative or bourgeois. bourgeois uh, socialism, and the uh, it 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 was implementation of a quasi-socialist system through the the capitalists' uh, system. So not not revolutionary, but gradual and uh, 
without any without altering any of the fundamental relations of labor and capital. Um, and then the third section was uh, critical utopian socialism and communism. And essentially, these these were these were plans that made by people who appealed to everyone, especially the capitalist class. And so these these socialists um, made no like they, they made no distinction, and they they basically begged for money to go start these utopian communes. But the uh, the fourth section is the position of the communists in relation to the various existing opposition parties. And this is where, this is kind of like the, the rally call, you know, the, the war call, but um, I'm going to read a little bit uh, from page 58 in the manifesto, and it's, uh, communists fight for the attainment of immediate aims, for the enforcement of the momentary interests of the working class but they never cease for a single instant to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat. That, that's the, that is the immediate goal, is it's always focusing on the next step and how to move towards the ne next step in uh, liberating the working class or educating and organizing the working class so that it liberates itself. Um, out from under the the heel of capitalism, um, and that's that's an outline of the book. If you want to open it up to Q and A or open it up to a discussion, <coughs> we're welcome to do that. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> All right, we're rolling.
I think that there's definitely been reactionary tenets in, in Mormonism and in some Christian sects, but um, Marx also said that a religious pain is a, is a human pain and a material pain. You know, so it's it's difficult to always denounce um, you know people who are religious as like entirely superstitious. I think that uh, their suffering again reflects a real material suffering. Um, and what what I am sympathetic to, and I'm you know uh, throw it back at me if you disagree. But what I am sympathetic to to church, and it, most predominantly here, is the fact that they meet once a week to talk about their ideas. Even if it is perhaps hegemonic and, and uh, patriarchal, sexist, homophobic, racist in, in some core tenets, um, I think it's, at least in my personal experience, it's really uh, condescending to totally denounce them because they are religious. And, and hey, there's a lot of like amazing, and, and you all know, like I'm as militant atheist that it's like, they come, but I think there's been amazing, amazing work done by um, Michael Minch, who's a liberation theologist, Will. You know, or Will Van Wagner, the Mormon worker, you know, and so I, I don't know. I, I think within each particular revolution, it kind of manifests itself differently. Like in the Spanish, in the Spanish Civil War, for instance, in 1936, um, you know, they literally massacred priests. Uh, but it was it was a, a very popular violence committed by the rest of, of the uh, pr most prominently the CNT if I'm thinking correctly um, because they thought that that was oppression it was out with the old and with the new and with the new uh, generation and with the young and with the you know, revolutionary change well I mean historically like the, the Catholic Church in Spain had always been intimately tied up with the state so that was like, you know it was part of, it was definitely part of that oppression and of course they also sided with the fascists in the war. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, I, I totally, just to reiterate a point you made, you know, Marx said uh, religion is the soul of, in, in a soulless world, right? And, and so he, he, his, his comment that religion is, is the, uh, the opium of the masses, if, if you actually read that, he, he's talking about um, the need for religion in this world of the working class to have these fundamentally wrong ideologies, it's a very material need um, in order to, to function within the society, in order to, to live on, you know. Um, and and I, I, think, I think he's correct in that uh, some of that will break down, maybe not all of it, um, but we should understand it as, as a contradiction in and of, it, in and of itself, that's a byproduct of the capitalist system. That's my opinion. Breakdowns in like post-revolution religion itself will disintegrate, is that what you're saying? I don't I don't think or like partially. Yeah, I don't think there will be the these structural religions. I think spirituality and idealism will live on. Um, not that I advocate for it. Uh, um, but uh, Well there's there's been some, you know, points in, in history when uh, religion was opened up um, and like heavily supported by certain socialist states like like Stalin. Uh, was it Stalin? Or was it Lenin? Stalin? There you go, Lenin. Uh, revolutionaries, uh, not so much Stalin. Uh, Stalin. 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 The, the Did they not? Oh, during World War II, was a, as a yeah, 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 yeah. nationalistic pride. There you go. You know, there you go. But, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Russian Orthodox Church was kind of. But it's not to say. I think right. it would be not overarching and even misleading to say that religion no, would entirely Lenin disappear. Was not they. Well, I was going to say, I think it would be misleading and too overarching to say religion would entirely disappear. I think we should distinguish from where it would disappear. I would advocate a disappearance from the state level, but within the civil society, which is all of us interacting now, this is civil, it, it, uh, you know, it would. I mean, people are still free to you know, go to their churches and, and, and worship as they please, but at least as I understand it, Again, I'm speaking subjectively, it would be advocating for a real separation of church and state. That means churches have to pay taxes if they're going to behave like, you know, a, a corporation. Um, that, that, and I don't know. I think that that would be something hugely revolutionary to what we have now. Um, I agree that, uh, and, and this is my my view of socialism. 
but I, I absolutely agree that people should be able to meet in their religious uh, ideologies even after the revolution if they want to. But I, I don't see any, any room for uh, religions owning capital, therefore paying taxes. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. a good qualification. To so um, um, yeah, like I agree, but only with certain religions. There's like so, like there's some religions out there that are just they're just bad. Just gonna throw it out there. Like, like, <laughs> like the Western Borough Baptist Church. Like I'm fine with that church just being gotten rid of. Like all the one, like the televangelist people that, of course, like they're, I mean, they're going to come out against socialism and they're going to do so in order to try to protect their own interests. I, and as far as televangelists go, I think they're more salesmen than they're actual capitalists. That's what I'm saying. saying. So you can infer that it's not the the most of and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the difference between them and the Westboro is that the Westboro are like extremists, but I'm not familiar exactly with them. I mean, fundamentally. But I mean, well, like, extremely, at, extremely, extremely the, dangerous. Like Pat Robinson, and like, who's the guy that like called for the assassination of Hugo Chavez? Is that Pat Robinson? Anyways, those guys, they're bastards, and they 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 hold sway over a lot of people, and uh, with the opinion that they're probably going to be super counter revolutionary, and those are just bad religions. I'm just going to throw it out there. As long as those guys run, they're bad. Uh, this is taking a turn, but. I, I had to read the manifesto like four times before I actually understood it. Does everybody understand the distinction between um, uh, uh, transitive property and private property? Because I sure as hell didn't. To me, private property sounded like I own a guitar. Communists want to take away my guitar? What? My bike? I love that thing, you know? That sounds awful. Private property used in this particular context is and they, I think that they should make a qualification. Sometimes when I talk about communism, I do make a qualification. That is uh, private productive property, right? And this is exactly what Kai like so aptly touched upon, is that um, private productive property has an inherent social relation. You have to hire workers to uh, gather your cotton. You have to hire more work workers to uh, put the cotton in a mill. You have to hire more workers to make the mill itself. Right, you see this sort of interconnectedness with with everything. Uh, again, a transitive property, because I, I, if I didn't make the distinction clear enough, would be like a bike. Right, bikes don't make other bikes, and, uh, and so necessarily they don't they don't necessarily have such a, a social impact. That's that's an incredibly important distinction to make. I think. So, was that was that okay to clarify? Did it, would it? Like, I, 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 anyway, I talked to communism with my cousin, and like that just changed everything for him, you know what I mean? Like, since then, he's been like so heavily immersed in the communist, you know, I don't know. I can keep that part of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. As opposed to the notion of like everyone gets everything or no one's allowed to have nice things. Wait, so. I mean, it, 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 would be, it would be mitigated, like, things like a house. Or if you've got a huge house, you're not allowed to keep your house because it's yours. If you're only, if you're the only one living there, yeah. I mean, th things like shelter and food and water are, will, will be essentially on a need basis, right? Because totally. they're they're right. required for human survival, which is the core tenet of communism: human survival versus profit survival. So, question: Your guitar, who decides what is something you get to? I mean, like, Big House obviously is kind of excessive. Like, who decides whether or not your guitar is excessive? Yeah. Totally. Well, I, I, hey, it would be up to uh, the will of the people. I mean, it's sort of an arbitrary question for uh, a hypothetical situation. Yeah, the, you know, I like that. I, we, however, we should question, well, to answer that, Zach, we should question how the guitar was made, by whom, and the relationship that went into it, you know what I'm saying? Um, so are you just saying, like, if you build the guitar yourself, you can keep it? <laughs> well, no, no, I, perhaps. I, I well, the other, the other, if you worked at all to 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 compensate anyone for the guitar, the, the guitar should be yours. Like I, I was going to use that that same example because Brett and I are on the same page here. Like I, my guitar is necessary for my comfortability. I mean, are our guitars scarce? Not be a problem. Guitars are scarce. Well, after you fail, you can't like, go into Walmart. Wait, wait. Let's let's keep it more organized. Everyone take turns. Sorry, no. I'm, I'm 
I mean, it, it's like um, if you if you open it up and you say, okay, uh, we have we have guitars. I don't I don't imagine there's going to be a lot of guitar manufacturing in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. Um, but the, the, the revolution, as you're saying, is again hypothetical. So hypothetically, it might be a rock and roll revolution. Well, I never, I never like to sway from like using concrete examples. We could use historical examples of like, well, if it came down to it, would free healthcare and food and housing and free education precede whether or not you get a guitar? You know, I, I, I would be called a radical for saying yes. You know, uh, and, and socialism, the very definition of socialism is um, uh, dissecting uh, or e evaluating and emphasizing the use value in products and disregarding or devaluating the exchange value within products. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, again, Marx's whole argument is that um, uh, we, we drink a cup uh, or we use a cup because it has an, an intrinsic use, right? We have more use for a cup than we do for like a Furby or like a fuck Barbie doll or something. You know, I, well, that's debatable for some people. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but it's the same principle, and it should be based on a very pragmatic, and I would say, uh, in most cases, democratic, you know, curriculum or basis. Excuse me. Just to throw it, throw it out. Doc, I think these are all really good things to talk about, but I like to keep in mind that if this is the crucial issue of the day, the how do we divide the iPods, how do we divide the guitars, how do we divide the houses, we've fucking won. Exactly. And exactly. we will be partying, and that will be great. Um, I, I think more realistically, our task right now is to think the, the revolution and think um, getting to that stage and, and having the distinction between the transit property and private property. Is a great place to look. Um, but it would be decided democratically, people would have a say, communities would be involved, um, and and that I think that for me suffices. Whereas um, thinking the actual avenues of revolution seems a much more daunting to ask personally. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would willingly give up all of my personal possessions for the revolution, including guitars and iPhones and keyboards and books. What about your yeah. fuck Barbies? <laughs> You'd have to wrestle me for it. <laughs> Old school. We'd oil up. Yeah. Me, me. Then uh, who would need the Barbie after that? <laughs> well, I, I do think it's I do I do think it's important to define terms, especially terms that are so commonly thrown around that are supposed to be introductory material, but I think are most commonly, you know, misunderstood. Uh, but but getting more more back into what Steve is saying, and Kai pointed this out again perfectly. Uh, communists should articulate the views of the working class. You know what I'm saying? A great example is the DREAM Act. We've been, we've been throwing this idea around for a long time, whether or not we should support the DREAM Act. Uh, does everybody know what the DREAM Act qualifies? Uh, military. Military is an aspect. You, can, you basically, it's either uh, an undocumented, a young un undocumented person can uh, go and um, be in the military for a while to get their or school. Or school. Or College and they can that offers them a path to citizenship. It is a legal path to citizenship for undocumented workers. Um, if they're dying for the country. Yeah. Well, well hopefully not. Want, <laughs> like we, our 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 support tentatively uh, would would be the R two organization and me personally. Um, the focus is on the education aspect of the Trinidad. Uh One one thing that we are wary of is that. The, the military clause is put there as a, as a trap for you know, gullible and uninformed youth to be like youth that can't afford to go to college. Or you can afford to do that as, as just an avenue to restock the military you know I mean? under, under the guise that you're, 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 you're doing your part and you're becoming a citizen, also go die for us. Yeah, well, the big the big thing that we were debating about is like. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Well, I I have been talking quite a lot. So you can you can really take it if you want it. Um, and my my personal take on the dream, I, I haven't really had time to talk to these guys about it. Um, but I I agreed at the beginning that we shouldn't support it because of that. Since then, I uh, I've come to think that this is 
it might be a mass organization. And uh, it, it's really important to go where the masses are um, and meet them where they are. Um, and, and through doing that, we can, we can uh, influence the movement. Um, and we can get them to think about maybe tentatively not supporting the military portion later, after the DREAM Act has been accomplished. And that, that's what they're talking about. Like, if this is accomplished, it's a beachhead for amnesty in the United States for illegal immigrants. And uh, that's my perspective. I think it's great. Read real quickly. Um, Kai actually read this passage, but I was rereading this yesterday. And uh, I just, sometimes this happens with Marx, I get a creepy feeling that he's like talking to me. Like, they, it just hits right on the money. Yeah. And I get that. <laughs> and that happens. It's one of those texts. It's just, you know, it, it resonates every time. And uh, we have been having this discussion. And Marx says, uh, again, I already read this. The communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims, for the enforcement of the, the momentary interests of the working class. I think mean, that's, that's very yes. clear. And that immediate aim for illegal immigrants is a avenue from illegal status to legal status. And he follows that, but but in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. And he goes on to give great examples that they're not particularly relevant, but in France, the communists ally themselves against so and so. Um, however, they take up a they have they reserve the right to take up a critical position in regards to the phrases and illusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolution. And he goes on to say in Switzerland, in Germany, in Poland, um, the point being, communists need to take the line of immediate benefit for people. People need to see immediate results. There's enough bullshit out there. There's enough opinions out there. There's enough people promising things every day to people. The communists need to ally themselves with concrete demands, concrete results, and from that position, take up the right to critique and move for a more sustained, long-term uh, revolutionary project. And I, I felt that, that reading that and Kai choosing that critical passage was just perfect for the same thing that we were talking about like at lunch is um, well we wouldn't want to be totally ultra leftist and not support it and lose this opportunity to, to win people over to, to revolution right the point of a uh, or the goal of a revolutionary should be to fight for revolution obviously um, yeah and that's exactly what I'm saying we wouldn't want to totally disregard on the, on the grounds of like oh let's bring in uh, you know Poor brown people to go and kill poor brown people, you know, which which is a, which is a great argument. But we don't need to mislead people when we're we're giving them our spiel on the Dream Act. We say, yeah, this is totally something that we're fighting for. But always give our qualifications. You know, we we wouldn't want to totally uh, withhold the qualifications that that are totally relevant. The fact that they're going to die and they're going to be blocking bullets for the rich is totally relevant to them in their situation. So, you know, I, 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 I don't know, just to, just to shed more light on, on uh, what we're talking about. Just the last few minutes, would everyone be interested if we actually went um, kind of back to what Marx is getting at here? Because right now at the DREAM Act, we're sort of applying, which is always awesome. But um, it'd also be really good to understand the importance of, of the history that Marx gives. Uh, the reason he talks about the development of feudal society into pre-industrial society and new industrial society, and sort of what that actually means. Um, you guys want to talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go to your head. Well, I'll throw out my two cents. I, I feel that the reason that's important and the reason uh, it gets developed further in uh, Das Kapital in uh, Section 8, so-called primitive accumulation, I'm always telling that's my favorite part. But um, by demythologizing the history of, of the development of capitalism, Marx is, is giving an analysis of how history developed, how it's A, unnatural. Um, there were laws, regulations, institutions involved with the seizure of private property, the seizure of common property, turning it into private property, and, uh, and basically creating a working industrial proletariat, and forcing them into factories, and creating the means necessary to create industrial capital. The, often we're given the Adam Smith story or, uh, I mean, just the Sean Hannity story that if some people are fucking lazy. We're going to bail them out. Why would we bail them out? I don't want to bail them out. I'm going to bail them out. I'm going to go, you know, Sean Hannity is <laughs> worse than that. 
But it, that, that's not the natural story. The natural story is, is a myth lost in history. The history we do have shows a very different story. And I think that's part of the, the critical importance of Marx's work is, is seeing that history develop. It gives us a sense of people in the present um, that things do change, that things are continually changing. And that for the bourgeois to develop into the, the dominant you know, imperialists they are today, that was a process of historical tra uh, transition and revolution. The, the bourgeois class had their own revolution to create what they had. And social conditions do change. And what, what makes us not idealist in saying, like, revolution, revolution, you know, Alex Caldera is talking all this shit and stuff. What makes us not, not idealist and not just completely bullshit is the fact that we have these historical examples and we're committed to them, we're committed to changing things. And we've seen that things do change in history. It's not this make-believe story that we're telling ourselves. Marx is, is analyzing actual progression, showing we can't change. Things do change. Yeah, it was, it was just the other day that I, I was having a conversation with this, this kid, and he was like, things won't change, things won't change. And I, and I get that, you know, you, you run in that a lot. And, and I just I said, do you realize the hubris and thinking that things aren't going to change again. Like I can't, I can't guarantee they're going to change how I want them to change, but they're going to change. Like this system, it's not eternal. Capitalism, I think it's eternal, but dialectical materialism—that's uh, a loaded term. But uh, I think we're verging on it in, in this conversation. Uh, tells us that change is inevitable. The inevitable, the change is constant, and uh, and I think once once I said that. A, a, switch flip, uh, a switch flipped in his head, and he started thinking about things in, in a more uh, a more uh, uh, long term uh, view. You know, not not thinking you know about I'm living in 2011. Barack Obama is the president, but I'm living on this continent in this century, and things have changed for so long, and will continue to change. Um, I think it's a critical part of Marxism to be. Understanding that we are part of that change and that change is happening. Well, look at in the last ten years. I'll, I'll be real quick, and I'm kind of dominating a few minutes left. But even capitalism itself has changed in, in the last five years. We've seen a firm commitment from uh, capitalism in the United States to abolish uh, Social Security and any sort of Medicare and welfare. Um, that, that's a that's a recent change, probably over the last thirty years, you could argue. But uh, since Reagan, it, it's been getting chipped out of the way, uh, you know, more and more. Those are real changes under capitalism. Even the capitalism of 50 years ago is different than it is today. And we've seen firm commitments, $700 million put forward to bail out a massive corporation. But we are no longer, or if we ever were, this sort of free market. We're firmly committed to keeping the rights and property of these corporations. And we've seen that in a $700 billion bailout. Uh, capitalism is changing. It's getting more desperate. It's making more... Uh, blatantly offensive maneuvers, too blatantly offensive to us people, saying that we have $700 billion to give companies, but oh, we're shit out of luck over Social Security and your medicine in you know, retirement. There's no, there's no room for you as a person, but there's plenty of room for AIG and, and uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And those are, those are major, major changes. Uh, capitalism is, is more blatant than ever. And I think that, that that's a concrete example we see just in the development of capitalism. Is it, is it too late to go into like a, a fact, a, an analysis of how that can turn into factions? I think I'd probably be more productive myself to go into overproduction. Which I, you know, if you I actually kind of have a question, Dave. Uh, um, so you said that capitalism over time will, you know, eventually produce so much that it will run itself out of resources and like, you know, eat itself, like you said. Um, so. With, how things are going in this day and age, what do you think that's going to look like with things like Walmart and you know, the world dominating things that are going on right now? You know, I, I don't have a lot of, I don't have anything really that comes to mind in the present, but in the Great Depression, um, people were starving to death and looking for work and not being able to find anything um, because the stock market crashed and everybody had, like jumped ship, all the corporations jumped ship. Um, there was, there were larger warehouses in Grenada. They could have gone to feed these poor people, but they were burned. Because this overproduced grain was too expensive to ship it out. It wasn't worth the money to ship it out because it wouldn't make any profit. Um, those, those sorts of things, it, it would look like um, 
the destruction of these of this surplus you know, property, the, the transitive property, the, the product, um, and it, it would be ultimately detrimental to people in, um, because it is not uh, profitable. Yeah, uh, I, I brought this up. Uh, yeah, like going along with what Kai said, I brought this up like, in my lecture last time. But like, just like they burn grain in the Great Depression today, currently, like I just read an article a few weeks ago about how banks are now bulldozing like vacant houses <laughs> in order to like force the value back up. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Massive foreclosures, people being pushed out of their houses, and their response is not to house people, but to bulldoze houses in so order to houses. somehow make money. Well, so, so, so like, in, yeah, a lot of yeah. so you force like decreasing the supply, you increase the demand. Yes. But I mean, how many of us have had a hard time getting to work at some point in our life? Me, for one, I've had a hard time getting to work. In, in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen the, the auto market crash. And what was the response just in the last five years from uh, our government? We fired almost 40,000 employees in the auto industry and then closed down three major automotive plants. Uh, and now we're just, we have cars, you know, they're now going on sale, they're older models. But how many of us could use cars? And, and how many of us could still use a, in those sorts of products that instead of being made available to the public, they close down and fire people. And then put those cars uh, in auctions or sell them off overseas. And we see none of that, even though we have, a, you know, a hard time making our way. Marx illustrated this um, under capitalism be because of the capitalist is constantly trying to export the, exploit the worker. Um, it, it'll starve the worker and undermine itself through, I, if not blatant overproduction, through the inability to support the worker. And firing, how many? 40,000? I think that was just two years ago, too. The firing that many people, putting that many people out of work putting them on the line of desperation. Yeah, no, that's just one business. That's not taking account of entire, you know, uh, um, unemployment rates into account. Or, or um, underemployment rates, right? Underemployment is, you know, you're working, but you still don't make it enough. My dad has an architectural license. He is fully certified as a national and state, and um, he works as a draftman for roughly like $38,000 a year because the architecture market is it's really hard to get into and there are so many in Utah that he's underemployed. He's way overqualified to just be a draft, but he's working at that level. That's that's like, you know, professors working as adjuncts or high school teachers or, or under underemployment can have all sorts of faces. Thanks for coming, everybody. Let's give Kai a hand.